Okay, now, Tony uh, Giacalone, that's your uncle? He's an uncle through marriage. So his daughter married my, my, my cousin. So my cousin, Anthony Bologna, uh, married his daughter, Nina. So that's how I'm married, and through marriage, it's it, not blood. But I was close to him because of that, though. He was always at our house. You know, my, my, my cousin, my mother, I lived with my mother. My parents divorced when I was very young. My mother grew up with Grace Toko. And I lived with my grandparents for 14 years. Now, my grandma and grandpa Toko. Well, her sister's son was Anthony. And so, and we all lived in like a two block radius. So they were always at our house. And then Tony Jacqueloni would be at our house all the time, almost daily during the sports season, you know, and hanging out with me. And that's how, that, that's what I was gonna tell you is, I had access to these high level mob guys almost by accident, you know, because of who I was, I was raised. My grandfather was Gumbadis with these guys. I mean, like best friends, they all grew up together, same thing. My grandpa was a very revered, and, and powerful man that everybody loved. He, he had a business in the Eastern Market, which is Detroit's Little Italy. They all did. They all had all the mob bosses had a head headquarters in the Eastern Market, and uh, so I was with my grandpa all the time, and uh, we all lived in the same kind of like almost enclave, enclave in, in Gross Point, Michigan, a very wealthy area. And within all three, four block radius, you had like you know 40, 50 high level mob guys all in the area, plus the bosses and the underbosses and everybody. Well, my grandfather, his eyes started going bad when I was a teenager. Uh, and so he started driving recklessly as hell. And that's when I, I said, Grandpa, let me drive. I'm living with him, you know? And he's like, like blowing through red lights and crap. And I'm like, Grandpa, God, let me drive you. You know, not, you gotta go to the store or go to your body's whatever. Let me drive you. So I start driving him all the time. So now I'm driving my grandpa and we're going to the headquarters of these high level mob bosses like Tony Zarelli and Tony Giacalone and Billy Giacalone and, and Paul Corrado and all the Gumbadis and Jack Toko too. And a lot of guys are under, under these guys because my grandpa was a huge bookie. He was a huge layoff bookie, huge. He had like 40 bookies under him. So we were riding all the time, picking up money and just going here and there. But when I'd stop, with these, with these guys, they all got headquarters like bakeries and like car lots and just, it could be anything, restaurants. And in the back, there's always a room and they're sitting around smoking Lillo's cigars and playing penny poker and telling war stories and that's what they do, they talk in Italian. They're super, they're super uh, uh, chatty. They love to socialize. They're always on the phone talking. And so what would happen was I, I would sit down with these guys and start talking to them and they, they think, hey, what happened, man? I heard that you were at Tony's place the other day. You busted it up. What happened? And Tony, Tony's a nightclub. Guy's got a nightclub. And he heard that I freaking, I smashed somebody's teeth out or something. And I ended up beating some guy's ass. And, and then so I get into telling the story. I said, man, this punk, he disrespected my boy. I did this, that, blah. So I ended up smashing his head. And, and I'm jumping around telling these stories. I'm sweating. And these old men, they're listening to every word. They love it. And they're like, ah, they're laughing. They're like, that reminds me of the time I did this and I did that. So now I'm like 18, 19, 20 years old. They're starting to like warm up to me. And then um, eventually they started saying, hey, you want to make a buck? You know, you want to do this? You know, go, I, I need you to collect this money. Or this one guy, he needs a tune-up, man. He ain't paying up. You know, this, this guy is uh, not paying, you know, tribute money for this or that and that. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, man. Make a buck. What do you need me to do, Tony? Whatever, anything you need. And I'd go smash some guy's head in or choke him out or drink what I'd have to do. And then, and that's how I got in, um, in you know, in the, in the end with them. Like the first, like Tony Jackaloni. Let me tell you a quick story about Tony Jackaloni was... He, he, he had a, a nephew who was getting picked on. His name is Tony also. And like, I was way far away at the beach and he calls me and says, listen, uh, they, they're picking on Tony here. You know how to handle this for me? So I said, yeah. So I jump on my ninja, I fly like 100 miles an hour, I go all the way to Gross Point. I was a long ways away at the beach. And I, re I went in the backyard with these kids who were like, had punched my cousin in the face. And uh, I basically went in there. I stormed up in the backyard. I got a white beater on him. I was I'm big, I worked out, you know. I said, which one of you motherfuckers put your hands on my, my cousin? And they were like, one of them said, oh, what's up, Al? Uh, uh, Anthony's your cousin? I said, you know who I am? I, I lived in a whole different city. So I was shocked they even knew who I was. But I knew if he knew who I was, they knew they were in trouble because I was no notorious for smashing fools. I said, so you know who I am? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're Gino's boy, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, well, you put your hands on my cousin. You must not know me that well. Because if you did, if you knew me, you would never do that. I said, next time you put your hands on my cousin, I'm going to come back here and smash every one of you bitches. So that's what I did. And he went, Tony went and told Anthony, uh, his, his uncle that, who was Tony Giacalone. And he told him, like, yo, he handled this. And then so Tony called me, like, a couple weeks later and said, yeah, my girlfriend, my gumar, she got an ex-boyfriend that showed up last night. She's, like, 30 years old. He's, like, 60. And he said he was drunk and he smacked her around and he's like, oh, I want you to handle it. So I was like, all right, man, no problem. Give me the address. So he gives me the address. I write it down. 
I put this big, huge nugget ring on my finger. I called my, called my cousin, my, um, my workout partner, Dario. I said, yo, we got to go handle something. He's like, do I need my piece? I'm like, no, no, no. Just bring a pool stick or something, you know? And we he comes to my house and we whip over to this house where this, this girl lived that was Tony Jack's Gumar, his girlfriend. And I snuck in the house. Like, I knocked quietly. She opens the door. I said, where's he at? She's like, in the back room. So I went in there and I freaking grabbed this guy out of the bed. He by his hair and just demolished him. I mean, just smashed him. He tried to fight back. That's why I smashed him. I was trying to say, you like to beat on women? You like to beat on women? He's like, what the hell for you? And he tries to swing. I'm like, man, well, I just started smashing him. You know what I'm saying? And I, my ring just tore his face up, dragged him out of the house, threw him down these steps, whatever. Got him in the car. He's like, who are you? Look what you did to my face. I said, I'm the, I'm the freaking boogeyman, motherfucker. I'm the guy who comes and you put your hands on a woman. I said, do it again next time. He's like, you did a face. I said, next time your face, you'll need a surgeon to put the face together, man. He starts reaching under his seat, though, right? I got the van, the, the, the door, oh, there was van open. He starts reaching under the seat. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought he was pulling a gun, you know? I grabbed a freaking uh, his hand. What's up? He's pulling out a crowbar. He's got a crowbar in his hand. I said, man, I said, I'll smash your freaking head in with this thing. Get the fuck out of here. And he left, and that was that. But the girl told Tony Jack, he's like, yo, I don't know who that guy was that you sent over here. But he was for no games. Like, I just went straight up in there and went ham on this freaking dude, mashed him, threw him out. And I'd see that girl for, for years. Every once in a while, I'd see her at a grocery store or a gas station or something, and she'd come over and whisper, thank you, you know? And okay. Now, uh, Tony uh, Giacalone was the number one suspect in Hoffa's murder because he was actually going to go meet uh, with Hoffa that day when he got killed. Yeah. Now, uh, I remember, I, you know, you talked about the whole uh, Frank Sheeran thing, you know, how... They say that he was the one who killed uh, Jimmy Hoffa. But I remember when I interviewed Michael Franzese, he told me the same thing, that uh, the Irishman was basically a bunch of nonsense. That, uh, yeah. You know, that Frank Sheeran had nothing to do nothing. with Hoffa's murder. No. Now, f the one thing that Michael Franzese did say is he said that he knows where Jimmy Hoffa got buried. And he said it's a very wet place, but he wouldn't say anything more. But I guess you had said in a previous interview that you have some idea where Jimmy Hoffa no. is buried or where his body was dumped off. Yes. I guess in the ocean? I can tell you that it's wet. <laughs> That's for sure. Do you know where, uh, you know where Hoffa was buried? Michael Francis, listen, I like the guy. I've, I've talked to him, you know, but I can assure you that Michael Francis has no idea where Jimmy Hoffa is. That's bullshit. And then that's, that's sad that he would say something like that because it really discredits his credibility. Um, he don't know Dick. He's a, he's, he wasn't even from the, you know, the area. Michael, am I, I have a theory on this, which is a lot like my friend Scott Bernstein's theory. Um, my, growing up, my grandfather, Peter Toko, had a warehouse in the Eastern Market, right? So behind, the East, behind him was an alley, and in that behind that alley was the Detroit Meat Packing Company. And they were a slaughterhouse. So they brought, you know, when they were done um, with the carcasses after they butcher an animal, they would slide the thing down the chute and with like soybeans and cornmeal and it would grind it into a paste and then pump it out into these 50 gallon drums they'd feed for pigs. Now, in my mind, the whole, my whole life, I think, let, let's say hypothetically, I may have known about a body, hypothetically, going that way, you know, because a guy, a guy did something wrong and, and they called the guy, his name is Pete the Greek. And they said, we, we gotta get rid of this body. They stuck him down the chute and they turned him to pig's feet and he was, and he was hypothetically turned, you know, pig's feet. Well, in my mind, I'm like, that's the way Hoffa went. But, but Scott Bernstein probably has the most realistic theory is that right after he was murdered, which was probably by Tony Pal and a couple other guys, um, maybe one from Jersey, I don't know. He, he, they, they took him right away to, a, the, um, I think it was, it was Vincent Mele had a, um, a uh, crematorium right by there, like a two, year, uh, two miles away from where he was murdered, which is the house that, that the, uh, they did find blood spatter in. Um, they were, he, they brought him to this crematorium and burned him into dust. And that was the end of it. There's no, I mean, these guys are smart guys, Vlad. Very, very, very smart. They're not going to put him in a trunk and drive him across the city, across the world, across the country. That, that's moronic. These guys are brilliant guys. They don't do stupid stuff. That'd be for an idiot to do. They plan this thing out from start to finish. They walked him in there with confidence. They double tapped him. They rolled him up in a freaking bag, stuck him in the back of a van, and drove him to a crematorium and stuck him in there and burned him to ashes. And that's it. Game over. There's no more Jimmy Hoffa. And everybody seals the deal. You know, everybody's quiet. Okay. You yourself, you got involved in the whole Detroit mob around the age of 14? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It started. Okay. So how did that whole thing come together? 
You know, it started because my uncle, Peter Toko, right? He was 12 years older than me. So not very much older than me. He's like an older brother. Um, and he was my favorite uncle, of course. And he had a new Cadillac. And he always had a gold chain and a big pocket full of money. And he was kind of became my mentor when in terms of La Cosa Nostra. He would tell me about La Cosa Nostra, about rules, about the edicts and the etiquette. And, the, and when I was very young, and I remember when I was probably like 12, I said, Uncle Pete, I saw this mini bike because I went to my grandparents' house every day for dinner. Like a few years, I, I didn't live with them. My mom went on her own. Then she got mentally ill, so we had to live with her again, my grandparents again. But on the way to dinner every su Sunday, I saw this mini bike. And I was like, Uncle Pete, I want, this, I want this mini bike. Would you buy it for me? He's like, I'm not buying no freaking mini bike. I'm very ashamed of this. But he says, I'll tell you how to get the mini bike. You know those Jerry Lewis cans you shake, you know, you can get the cans at the liquor store and you stand in front of the place like, would you like to donate to Jerry's kids, muscular dystrophy, blah, blah, blah. He's like, get one of them cans, stand in front of the liquor store for freaking a couple hours, shake it up and you get the money and then buy your mini bike. I thought nothing of it. My uncle, who I looked up to, tells me to do this. I'm like, okay, so I get the can. I stand in front of the 7-Eleven liquor store. I make about 12 bucks. It ain't enough. But I know there's a Kmart like five miles away. So I jump on my pedal bike and I'm 12 years old. I drive a like five, seven miles of this big Kmart, and I stand in front of it for like five hours, shaking this can. Would you like to keep filling the can, dumping it in a bag, filling the can, dump? I drove back. I got 140 bucks. Went, went home, counted at 140 bucks. I turned 10 in, kept 130, and called my dad. I said, listen, take me to buy that mini bike. It was 90 bucks. So I got the mini bike. Same thing, my uncle, when I had a a couple years later, I was into freestyling on the bike tip. You know what I'm saying? Doing all the crazy tricks on the bikes. I wanted this Haro, this badass Haro. It was like 300 bucks. My mom told me for my birthday she'd give me 100 bucks. We were on welfare, so I didn't have much money. he would give you 100 bucks. It's about all I can afford. So I'm like, go to my Uncle Pete. Uncle Pete, man, listen, I, I want to buy this bike really bad. I mean, would you, would you, you know, I know you got money. You got a big pocket full of money all the time. Would you buy me the bike? He's like, man, let's get the hell out of here. I'm not buying you a freaking bike. Go get your cousin Frankie, the same mass murderer in Frankie. He lives around the block. I go get Frankie, he comes over, he says, he says to Frankie, he's like, listen, go get Alonzo's bike. He'll give you 50 bucks to steal a bike from Gross Point South. Go up there in school hours, steal a bike, bring a bike, give you 50 bucks. So he did. So Frankie went and stole me the bike. Now I got to keep 50 and got a bike for 50. And it was like, you know, and my uncle was teaching me about these things. And then eventually, when I was like 15, he had got me a sinecure job where, where I go in and collect a check at a restaurant, real nice high-end restaurant, because the guy who managed it was this fat cokehead gambling degenerate who owed him like 20 G. So he's like, we're gonna make up a job. So he tells me, listen, once a week, you're gonna go in there and pick up this check for 350 bucks. I'm like, okay, what do I do? He's like, nothing, just walk in there and get the check. I'm like, okay, so this is, this is actually really funny, Vlad. You're gonna, this, is, you're gonna, this is gonna crack you up. So I do this for months. I walk in, get a $350 check, bring it to my uncle, and he gives me 50 bucks. And he keeps 300. That's how this freaking degenerate is paying off the gambling debt and drug debt, whatever. This fat dude named um, Artie, I think was his name. Uh, Harry, that was it. Anyways, one day I'm walking out of there and I, and I see this big box. This is funny. A big box of um, perch fillets. Big. They were famous for their perch fillets. And I, and I look at it and I'm like, them perch fillets look like silver bass fillets. And I tell the guy, I said, you know what, man? I, sell you, I said, how much you pay for them perch fillets? He's like, Two fifty a pound. I said, "Listen, I'll sell you silver bass for a dollar fifty a pound." He's like, "Well, people will know the difference." I'm like, "Telling you, they won't know the difference." In fact, to this day, people, they, if you go to the store and you see you see lake perch, that's what you're buying, silver bass, not yellow perch. And I said, "Nobody will know the difference. I promise you. I'll get some. We'll put them out there in a the platter, send them out, and you see what happens." I'll tell you. And I said, "You can make a freaking." They sold a ton of this stuff, man. They sold like a thousand pounds of this stuff a week. But I knew I could catch them. Me and my boys would go out on a boat, and if you follow the schools. You basically watch the seagulls, and the seagulls go crashing down. They're following this bait fish, and the silver bass chase the bait fish. So you can sit out there all day and just cast and, ca and catch like 500 of these fish. And they're about that big. And then you take them down to this market, Samson Fish Market, and pay them a, a dollar or I think it was 30 cents a pound to fillet them. Then I could take the, those fillets to this guy, Harry, and sell them to a dollar fifty pound. It was fun. I mean, my boys loved it. So we would go, they didn't, they were like, do it for free. So we would go out fishing and catch like 500 pounds of these things. The boat would look like it's sinking, dude. It was like, they would flop out of the boat. We would, we would take them and we'd catch them and bite their heads. <laughs> so they would, they'd be dead. So they wouldn't flop out because they were money, man. They were like gold to us, you know? So the boat would fill up. When we'd fill the boat up to almost sinking, this little boat with a little motor, 
and we'd freaking go back and get them filleted, and I'd bring them to this freaking guy, and I'd make like 500 bucks a week or something, you know, selling this guy these fake perch. It was my first racket. My uncle thought it was hilarious. He didn't even ask me, he didn't even ask me for a cut. He thought it was great, you know what I mean, whatever. But that was the introduction into that kind of world where, you know, anything gray, anything gray, you know, you bend the rules and make your own rules, the gray area. And about that, you know, about that time, I really, that's when he started telling me the who's who of the hierarchy of the, the family and the bosses. But there were so freaking many, man, that I couldn't keep track up. And I was, I'm horrible with names. Unless I was dealing directly with the guy, I really just didn't care. Because I knew, he told me one thing, he told me all the time. He's like, doesn't matter because you're half-breed. You're what's called a defetto. A defetto means, in Italian, means defective. Because I'm half Sicilian. Because I'm half Sicilian, I can't write. That's how my, my novels, you know, my books. You looked up my books. The, the main character is a defetto, but he's actually half Sicilian on his father's side. So it's not that bad. If, you, if it's on your father's side, you can still become a capo and get made and do all these things. But if it's on your mother's side like me, I knew I couldn't be nothing but a freaking soldier. So I kind of just didn't really pay that much attention to the whole mob stuff. I did more. I mean, I was involved in it always till the day I got locked up. But, um... I never thought to myself, oh, someday I'm going to be a freaking capo, a capo regime and have a crew and run, run, run a family. You know, I just, I, I was told I couldn't do that. That would never happen. Even if like at one point, my uncle Sal said you could change your name to Toko, which is your l legal name. They all, half the family thought my name was Toko anyways. I was introduced to your cousin Alonzo Toko. Everybody thought I was a Toko because my mom and I got divorced when she was four. So, I mean, when I was four, so a lot of the people in the family didn't even know, you know, when I got older that I wasn't a Toko. But anyway, so when you, you can't rise up to be anything, I never really aspired to be anything. So I just was kind of a, you know, a soldier for my uncle and anyone else for hire, basically. Okay. By 15 years old, you were expelled from school permanently. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I got expelled from school at 15 years old, um, which is ironic because I was talking to Sammy the Bull. I kind of made friends with Sammy the Bull. Um, and he, we, we were talking and we both got, what's, we have this in common, it was the same thing. Like he had a learning disability. I, I kind of had a learning disability too. It was more like I could, the, the curriculum wasn't interesting enough for me to want, pay attention. So I just was you know, a troublemaker. And he got kicked out uh, when he was 15. I got kicked out. I was expelled indefinitely. Even my grandfather, who tried to get me back in, back in which is kind of crazy. It's the only time I ever saw my grandpa use his power to try and, for influence. And he sat down at the, with the school board and he said, listen, my grandson, I want him to finish school. I want him to stay in school. The first thing he says, you know who I am? And they're like, yeah, we know who you are. Because he said, I'm Peter Toko, Peter Paul Toko. You know who I am? And they said, yeah, we know who you are, Mr. Toko. And like, we don't want your, son, your grandson back in the school. He's trouble. Been in school 10 weeks. He's been in 10 different fights. He's been expelled, t or suspended t uh, 10 times. He got freaking, I got busted in this ring where I had a friend that was breaking into lockers and stealing all this crap. And I got caught, like, caught up in it. And so they were just like, we, we don't want him in there no more. So at 15, now I'm com completely expelled indefinitely from school. What do you think I'm going to do? You know what I'm saying? I just took up full-time crime, you know, selling drugs, basically selling drugs and, and, and dealing with bad guys. All, all the rejects in the neighborhood, and there's a lot of rejects. You always got bad guys that have been kicked out, expelled, dropouts, whatever. So they sell drugs, they steal, they rob, they do that. These are the guys I started dealing with all day. And I did have my own little crew, and, and that, you know, that's how I was raised, how I came up. Okay, what kind of drugs were you selling during that time? Just weed, mostly, and a little bit of coke. And uh, it was, that's a funny thing. I had a little plug on a Coke. Man, I'd get an eight ball here and an eight ball there. But what I would do is buy mini thins, the Fedrins. Remember back in the day, you could buy mini thins. You know what I'm saying? That the little, you know what I'm talking about? Mini thins? The little white pills that are like speed. And you, I'd crush them up. And I then I with a little bit, with some Coke, and I'd sell it to these freaking guys in the neighborhood. And they'd call me back four hours later. I'll oh, take some more of that. You know, and I'd bring them some more. But at that age, I really wasn't heavy in the game. Okay, so now you're out of school, permanently. You're starting to get into petty crimes and drug dealing and so forth. At what point do the crimes start to build up into more serious things? I mean, that's about the time, you know. Uh, that, that's about it. Um, you know, about 16, 17, around, around age 16, I, 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 I had so much traffic coming over to my house to buy weed every day that I had to stop that. Like, like the, the, I, the school got out of 250, right? And at, at the 255, there was nine cars parked in front of my house. People getting out of the car with money, counting the money as they walked. Them. I lived in the suburbs 
You know what I'm saying? I lived in a nice, you know, kind of middle class suburb called St. Clair Shores. And my neighbors had to know. I mean, here you got 10 cars pull up every day at, at 3 o'clock. And they're all counting money. And I get mad one time. I smack a dude, man. I said, you serious? He runs up, runs up. He goes, man, can I give you the $4 tomorrow? And he's counting. I said, man, get the fuck out of here. I smack him. I said, bro, you don't think I got neighbors, man? What are you doing, bro? You walk up to my house, counting money. Can I pay you for the bag tomorrow or whatever? Get the hell out of here. So I basically what I did was I got a, I put together a crew a guys that, that sold my weed for me. And I, it was a funny thing. I, it was kind of a little bit younger than me and these little kind of punk kids from the neighborhood who thought they were gangsters, but they weren't. You know, they listened to too much rap, uh, like gangster rap, and they thought they were gangster in the neighborhood, but they really weren't. So I got them together. I told them I wanted to meet them all at one place, and they were you know, worried that what the hell was up. And I went in there. I said, listen, this is what I did. I said, here's a quarter pound for you, a quarter pound for you, a quarter pound for you, and a quarter pound for you. I said, I want, I'm ashamed of this, man. I'm I told them to give me 900 bucks for a quarter pound. 900 bucks. And I told them, if you sell it all at, at 30 bucks an eight, they'll make, no, they'll make $160. I mean, that's it on a quarter pound. They, and they were too scared to say no. They knew me. They were like, thought I was a lunatic. So I said, here, take this weed, you know, and sell it and only make 160 bucks. And then give me the money every Friday and I'll give you some more. They were too scared to say no. One of them was enterprising. He started taking my money, he'd flip it, and then he'd, get a, he'd take the money and get his own plug and buy some more, and I ended up having a problem with him. But it, and then I got into selling steroids, which is, um, was a whole other thing. The, the, the steroid game was, was huge at the time, and I worked out at a gym. I started working out at a gym when I was 16, and it turned out to be the most steroid-infested gym in the history of America. That's what the newspaper said at the time, you know. And there was this guy named Joe DiMaggio, this huge, this dago mob guy, wise guy, you know. And he was running this whole operation out of this gym. And, and I walked up to him eventually and I said, hey, man, Joe, I was getting juice from him from a guy, this huge lunatic named Jerry Gaudet. But that, that dude went away to play college baseball. So now I lost my plug and I was selling steroids to all these high school football players, like all the high schools in the area, like five of them, making a lot of money. And I, I, so I said, Joe, I pulled him aside. I said, Joe, can I talk to you? This dude is like 35 years old, humongous steroided monster. I'm 16 years old. I mean, I was pretty nervous to even approach the guy. And I, I said, Joe, listen, I, I, I'm Sal, I said, I'm Sal Toko's nephew. You know, so my uncle Sal, I think. He's like, yeah, Sal, Pete's brother? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm his nephew, man. So I said, but can I talk to you for a minute in the locker room? And he said, yeah, he's coming to the locker I said, listen, man, Jerry dumped, I said he was going to plug me to you, but he left. I don't have nothing. I got all these orders. I'm like, I'm the guy who was getting other stuff from Jerry. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. This guy turned out to be freaking a huge, like, kingpin. So they got him with what they said was a million doses, eight kilos of coke, like 10,000 rounds of ammunition, 100 pounds of weed, blah, 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 blah. And he ended up beating it. He had a good lawyer, spent like a million bucks on a lawyer. And um, he ended up like with five years probation with a tether or something. But, um, but anyways, you know, that's what I started doing, pumping the steroid game and the counterfeit. Most of them are counterfeit steroids. You know, some are real. He'd tell me which is counterfeit, which is real. If it's for you and your boys, these good ones, the, the fake ones, people buy them anyways, a the placebo effect. And so <clears throat> I did good. And what happened with that was he, they, 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 I was under, the feds had been watching me go to his house and on the wire, on the, on the, on the, they had his house wired. But they didn't bust me till after they busted him. And I came to the gym and everyone was all quiet. I'm like looking around, like, what's going on, man? Freaking kind of a weird vibe going on. And they're like, you didn't hear? I'm like, hear what? And they're like, Joe got busted last night at freaking midnight. And I'm like, what? So I'm freaking out. And I call him and he says, come over and we take a walk. And he's like, don't worry about it. The lawyers, I bonded out, lawyers on it, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, but it's over. So, okay, like three days later, freaking I'm, my boy is in front of my house rolling a joint. We're about to go to the gym actually and uh these two feds come walking up and they looked at you know they look like feds man leather coat sunglasses beeper pistol and he walks up and my boy is not paying attention the guy walks up and says gunner in the house what the frick and he's like uh i don't know i just pulled up and then there was another cop and they came in they freaking told me i was under arrest for conspiracy to deliver i got busted too you know, had a couple deliveries and I kind of ended my steroid run for a while, but there, there's more to it. I mean, I ended up getting a plug as soon as I got out of that. I got a whole nother plug from Mexico and kept it pumping.